Good morning, everybody. We're live here from the Bird House, and today we're talking about woodpeckers and some of their different biology, the species we have around here, how you can tell the difference between males and females, and of course, how you can attract them to your backyard. As always, we love to know who's on. You can say hi in the comments. If you have questions, you can absolutely put those in the comments as well. And we'd love to know what kind of things you're seeing if you're out birding or in your backyard, what kind of birds you're seeing out there right now. We always love to have that kind of report as well, but we'll get started here talking about woodpeckers. So woodpeckers in general, mostly are going to live in woodlands and in forests where there's a lot of trees, makes sense. They will forage for insects on trees and in branches. They communicate by drumming. So if you're ever walking through and you hear what sounds like somebody knocking really, really fast on something, that is a woodpecker doing its drumming. And they do that to attract mate, to establish their territory. Um, so the other woodpeckers know that they are around. And they will create holes in trees where they will, uh, in those cavities, are their nesting cavities. So they'll use those to lay their eggs, and they'll use those to roost in, so to stay out of the, the conditions in the outdoors. So they do some different things with trees. Not only are they foraging for food, um, they will also use those trees to establish their territories with the drumming sounds. And then they'll use the trees to nest in as well. So they do have some pretty cool biology as well. And uh, there's a question you know that always comes up about woodpeckers why don't they go why don't they get headaches why don't they get uh concussions and the the reason for that is they do have specialized skulls and um inside this specialized skull there's a couple different things um first they have a really long tongue and that tongue when it's not out will wrap all the way around their 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 skull so it goes all the way wraps all the way back and up around their head. So that helps with a little bit of the of the pressure and of the impact of when they are pecking the wood. So that's one reason. And woodpeckers do have really long tongues. So if you ever get a chance to see a woodpecker sticking its tongue out, and it's pretty crazy. Here's a pileated woodpecker with its tongue sticking out. So depending on the feeder that you have, um, you know, if there's some kind of seed that's way up and inside of it, um, they can reach it pretty, pretty well because they do have such, such long tongues. But then they have a specialized skull as well that will help for impacts. So first of all, their lower mandible, which is the lower part of their beak, tends to extend a little bit longer than the upper mandible and that just helps with the impact so the impact is going to the to lower part of their of their beak before hitting something else and their brains are fairly lightweight so they don't weigh a whole bunch um, so there's not a lot to be jostled around too much in there and um, their their skulls are are specially designed to uh to be able to take impact from the front so um, their skulls are just specially designed to take in some of that impact. So really, really neat. And you can see here in the diagram how the tongue just wraps all the way up and around its head. So really, really cool. So they do have very, very long tongues. And woodpeckers also have specialized feet. So they have what are called zygodactylous feet. And that's a fancy word for just meaning two toes are pointing up and two are pointing back. So if you think of most birds, they've got three toes in the front and one in the back. Well, woodpeckers are different. They've got two and two, and that makes it uh, easier for them to cling onto surfaces. So you can see it a little bit better here in this picture. There's two toes here pointing up and then two pointing down so then they can cling to different structures like the side of a tree quite easily or they can cling onto that suet feeder you have in your backyard so it makes it really really easy for them to cling onto things and as far as different species that we have here in upstate new york this is probably going to be 
the most common one you'll find in your backyard or when you're out hiking. This is the downy woodpecker. And downy woodpeckers, if uh, we'll see, the next woodpecker looks very, very similar to the downy woodpecker. Downy woodpeckers are about the size of a suet cake. So if you do feed suet in your backyard, that's a really good way to determine what species you have. If it's small, about the size of a suet cake, that's going to be your downy woodpecker. And when you're identifying males versus females with woodpeckers, the key is males will have more red on them. So that, that is the way to identify them. And here with the downy woodpecker, the males have red on the back of their head. So if you don't see any red on the back of the head, that is a female downy woodpecker. And downy woodpeckers call is kind of a, they consider it a descending whinny and it's um, that the sound kind of descends as they are calling. And I'll play that for you right now. I've got my Identify, uh, identifier, this is called, and um, this has different sound cards. You can slide in and out of it. And I've got my woodpeckers card here. And so woodpecker called. So that last part right there is going to be your descending whinny there. So really common uh, sound to hear um, if you are out hiking anywhere where there's a lot of trees, probably hear that downy woodpecker call. So really common woodpecker that we have here all year round. Most of these are going to be birds that you can find here all year round. There's a couple exceptions that tend to, to stray a little bit, but um, your, your downy woodpecker, absolutely common all year round. So. Uh, here's a downy woodpecker hole. So they do, all these woodpeckers do nest in trees. They are cavity nesters. So they'll nest in hollowed, uh, the hollowed out sections of trees. Like here's uh, what a typical woodpecker nest will look like. It goes down deep into a cavity. Um, or there's houses. You can get bird houses for woodpeckers. And what makes it a woodpecker house, I'll show you some as we go on, what they look like is going to be the size of the hole and then also the depth of the house. They tend to have houses that are deeper than, say, a bluebird house or a chickadee house. So they do like a, um, a bit of a deeper nesting cavity. So here's your typical downy woodpecker uh, nesting cavity here. And Here's, a, here's one just sticking its head out of a tree right there. So um, if you notice the, the, any trees in your backyard or if you see anything that has what looks like a fresh hole in it, it could be used as a nesting cavity for uh, some kind of species of woodpecker. And now here's the hairy woodpecker. So the hairy woodpecker looks pretty similar to the downy woodpecker. But the hairy woodpecker is going to be larger, more substantial. So it can be hard to tell the difference unless you see the two of them next to each other. So here's a picture on the left of a downy woodpecker and then the hairy woodpecker is next to it. But if you remember that the downy woodpecker is about the size of a suet cake, the hairy woodpecker is going to be larger than that. So the hairy woodpecker is more the size of a red-bellied woodpecker. So they're going to be quite a bit larger. And uh, just like the downy woodpecker, the females don't have any red on them. So this picture on the left here is both a female downy woodpecker and a female hairy woodpecker. And then the, the male hairy woodpecker has the red on the back of the head. And if you look at the differences in the beak as well, you can see that the hairy woodpecker does have a more robust and larger beak. So that's how you can tell the differences there between the hairy woodpecker and the downy woodpecker. So this is another species that's here all year round. So you can find them coming to feeders, you can find them in the woods all year round. Red-bellied woodpeckers are another common bird that comes to feeders, that, that will come to feeders. And these are birds that are actually expanding their range too. So they're becoming more and more common than they used to be. And just like the other species we were looking at, the males will have more red on, their, on them than the females do. Um, so on the left-hand side here, we've got a male. And if you look at the red on the male's head, it goes from the, the beak all the way to the back 
of its head. And now the females will have a gray patch on the top of their head. So they don't have that red that stretches all the way towards the back of their head. So this is your red bellied woodpecker. And that name can be a little deceiving because it can be hard to see that red belly. In this picture on the left here, you can kind of see there's a little bit of a red tinge there. Um, a lot of these birds were named back in the day when um, they were shot out of trees and in the person's observer's hand. And in hand, you could easily see that this woodpecker does have a red belly, but when we're out there watching them, if they're uh, clinging onto a tree or onto your suet feeder, you might not see that red belly. So, but it's but it's there. So these are your red-bellied woodpecker, and the call of the red-bellied woodpecker is uh, is another one that you'll hear as you're out in the woods hiking. It's a really common call to hear, and I'll play that for you right now too. So that little trilling sound is a really, really common call to hear. And there's nothing that sounds quite, quite like it. So that's a good call to learn if you're starting to learn your different bird calls. The, the call of the red-bellied woodpecker is um, one that really doesn't sound like anything else. I'll play it for you here again so you can hear it. So that is the red-bellied woodpecker. And again, another cavity nesting species. Here's a picture of a red-bellied woodpecker excavating a cavity. It's got its bill all full of wood chips. So definitely another cavity nester. So here's the red-headed woodpecker. And uh, sometimes people call the red-bellied woodpeckers red-headed woodpeckers because they have so much red on their head. Um, but this is the actual red-headed woodpecker. And you can see why they get that name. They have that bright, bright, red head. And the red-headed woodpecker used to be quite common, but is in some pretty substantial declines. And I pulled these stats from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology site. They're all about bird sight. Um, and they're, the red belly, or the red-headed woodpeckers have declined by over 2% each year from 1966 to 2014, resulting in a cumulative de decline of 70%. So they are really in some large, large population declines. And the red-headed woodpecker is a bird that you might see here in the wintertime, but they're going to be more common in the spring and in the summer. They're somewhat nomadic, so they can be common in one location one year and then absent from that location the following year. So there's no real rhyme or reason to where they might pop up. Um, you can find them locally here, usually around the lake shore. So Durand Eastman Park, uh, Webster, out in uh, Whiting Road Park is another place that they're seen, Turning Point Park sometimes. So kind of scattered around um, the, the area out of Braddock Bay, they have them sometimes. Um, the red-headed male and female can't really tell the difference between them, but the juveniles look quite a bit different. So here is the juvenile up here in the corner, it's going to have not that bright red head for, for quite a while. So um, you can tell the difference between a juvenile and an adult. So this is the red headed woodpecker, really cool bird. I'll play you their call too, because um, usually you'll hear them before you see them. They have a call that's pretty distinctive too. <laughs> kind of sounds like somebody screaming. <laughs> so that is your red headed woodpecker. Um, so, so not going to be common around here, but I should mention they are more common down south. So if you're watching from, say, the Carolinas or, uh, you know, down further south of that, they're going to be more common than they are here in New York. So that is your red-headed woodpecker, really beautiful bird. Sometimes they do come to feeders every once in a while. People get them at their feeders. It's a really special thing if you do get one, though, because they are in such big population declines. The northern flicker, we've been getting a lot of reports of northern flicker coming to feeders this winter, probably because we've had so much snow, which continues to fall. Uh, so here out in the east, we have northern flickers that are called yellow shafted flickers, meaning the underside of their feathers are tinged in yellow. So if you see these birds in flight, they have these really beautiful a uh, uh, yellow wash on, on the underside of their feathers. Now, if you go out west, 
uh, the northern flickers are called red shafted flickers, and I'll show you a picture of what that looks like, but they have a red wash underneath their feathers. So same species, but they are, um, they have just different color morphs, one east and one on the west. And you can tell the difference between your northern flicker male and female as well. And this picture here is of a male flicker and you can tell because the male has a mustache so they have that black mustache and the female is not going to have that so the picture is a little small but this the picture of the woodpecker here the flicker in flight this is a female because it doesn't have that black mustache on on the face so really cool birds they uh we get a lot of questions what's the difference between the northern flicker and a red-bellied woodpecker uh, the red-bellied woodpecker is going to have more red on their head, and the northern flicker has polka dots on its breast, whereas that red-bellied woodpecker will not have that, and they're going to have more of um, black and white across their back, whereas the northern flicker is more of an overall brownish type of color. So this is your northern flicker. Really cool if you're getting them on your, your suet feeders this winter. They are going to be more of a common backyard bird in the winter when we've got that snow cover and it's harder for them to find some natural sources of food. As their name suggests, they do a flicking motion. So while you might see these guys in trees, they're often seen on the ground. That's where they're going to flick leaf litter and debris all around. Um, they flip leaves up in the air as they're looking for some kind of food. So that's how they get their name, the Northern Flicker. They flick, um, they flick all kinds of debris around on the ground in search for food. So here is the red shafted Northern Flicker. So if you go out West, if you do any traveling out West, you'll see that the Flicker out there has this red wash under its wings. So really cool. Some, some regional differences there between some species. And the Pileated Woodpecker. This is going to be the largest woodpecker that we have in North America. So they're quite, quite large. They can be up to 16 inches in length. So huge bird. Um, just like all the other species, you can tell the difference between male and female because the Pileated Woodpecker male will have more red on it. So on the left here is the female. And if you look at the face, you can see the face, this stripe that goes from its bill kind of back along its face is all black. And on the male, which is the other picture here, it's red. And then they're, uh, they've got more red on their head too, just like that red-bellied woodpecker where the red goes from the, the tip of the bill all the way to the back of their head. That's going to be the same situation here for the pileated woodpecker. So the male pileated woodpecker is on the right here and you can see it has much more red on the top of its head than the female here on the left. They've got a little black patch there in between their bill and the, and the, the top of their crest. So that is your pileated woodpecker, another cavity nester. And you can tell that pileated woodpeckers are around because they do excavate some pretty uh, some some pretty substantial holes in trees. So most of these woodpeckers will make small circular holes in trees, which can be pretty substantial. But if you see a pileated woodpecker hole, you know it because it tends to be quite large and rectangular in shape. So on the left hand side here is what your pileated woodpecker holes are going to look like in trees. And the pileated woodpecker, if you're walking through the woods, their call is very loud. It can echo through the forest really well. And so I'll play you their call as well. So here is the pileated woodpecker call. So they can be quite loud. The drumming can also be loud and reverberates through the woods. So uh, if they're around, you usually know. So they do make some pretty big holes in trees. And here's a video of a pileated woodpecker making some quick work of a tree or a tree stump here. So if you're walking through the woods and you come across a giant pile of wood chips like this, that's going to be your pileated woodpecker. So um, this is a bird here that's looking for some food. So you can see the size of that uh, damage that the woodpecker is doing. It's pretty substantial.
if you're trying to attract pileated woodpeckers, the best thing you can do is live in a place that has a lot of trees. If you've got some trees that are dying, as long as they're not in the, in the way of anything, you want to keep those trees up. It, gives, it does give them that habitat that they need to, to nest in. Um, but if you want to put up a house for them, um, your, your best bet would be putting out a large house like a wood duck house, something that's pretty substantial um, because they do need that large entrance hole because they are such a big bird. Um, but in general, they're really going to excavate their own homes, the pileated woodpeckers will. Now, this is one of our migratory woodpeckers. So the red-headed woodpecker is the other species we talked about that will sometimes travel and some kind of nomadic. They're going to be more common here in the spring. Same with the yellow-bellied woodpecker. So, or excuse me, yellow-bellied sapsucker, which is a type of woodpecker. And the, here's a map here. Here's their range map. The orange is going to be their breeding range yellow migratory range so that's you know when they're in transition between the two and then the the white here is their winter range so this is a little off because recently over the past couple of years there's been more and more sightings of yellow-bellied sapsucker in the winter time so last winter quite a few people were seeing yellow-bellied sapsucker around and some people are still seeing them locally now so the map isn't 100 percent there as they usually aren't um, so you might just see these birds here in the winter time so if you see something that looks like uh, almost size wise uh, in between and hairy woodpecker but it's kind of like a little bit thinner could very well be a yellow-bellied sapsucker. They have this yellow wash on them. They have red on the top of their heads, and then the male has a red throat as well, but the females don't. So here's a female on the left-hand side, and then here's a male. Like their name suggests, they do like sap from trees, so they'll also eat insects. This isn't going to be a, a bird yet that you'll really see coming to your backyard feeders. Every once in a while, people do report them, not so much on their suet feeders, but on, in their hummingbird feeders. So if you put out a hummingbird or oriole feeder in the spring, you might just get yourself a yellow-bellied sapsucker coming to it if you're lucky. And yellow-bellied sapsuckers will leave very distinctive marks in trees. So um, when we were talking about the pileated woodpeckers, they leave those huge rectangular holes. The yellow-bellied sapsucker leaves these very small holes, but they're in pretty straight lines on the trees. So here is some typical yellow-bellied sapsucker uh, damage to a tree. And the idea here is they'll drill a whole bunch of tiny, small holes and then as the sap starts to flow um, through, the, they can have a whole bunch of different locations where they can drink that sap. And then that sap will also attract insects so they can get some insects uh, coming out of that, that, that tree as well. So this is your typical yellow-bellied sap sucker uh, signs here. So any walk through the woods, you'll probably see something like this in there so keep an eye out for yellow-bellied sapsucker more in the fall or more in the spring um, they tend to start showing up in larger numbers around april or so but you never know you might just see them here now they have been reported locally and as far as attracting woodpeckers to your backyard it's pretty easy they aren't going to be a super picky bird that's not like a bluebird where you kind of need the right habitat and you need the right things to attract them Woodpeckers are pretty easy. You might not get everything. You might not get those big pileated woodpeckers, but you could probably get everybody else. So the best thing you can do is put out a suet feeder. That is number one, going to be the best way to attract woodpeckers to your backyard. And we always recommend these, what are called paddle tail suet feeders. And the idea behind those is unlike those little small square cages, these paddle tail feeders give the woodpeckers a place to prop themselves up with their tail. So woodpeckers will use their tail for stability. It's like a third leg of a tripod. And having a paddle tail feeder allows them to do that. So you can see that here. Um, there's the, especially for the large the pileated woodpeckers, you can see how uh, it's using that tail prop to prop itself up otherwise they kind of flop around on the feeder a bit and it can be hard for them to get stability on it and even this red-bellied woodpecker here is using that tail prop to prop itself up 
upright. So suet feeders are absolutely the best way to go. There's lots of different flavors, if you will, of suet too. We always recommend something with nuts in it is great. So anything with peanuts in it, peanut butter. Um, if you have squirrel issues, you can do hot pepper suets. And the idea there is squirrels can taste the hot pepper, but woodpeckers and birds in general don't have as many taste buds, so they cannot taste it. So hot pepper suet is uh, a, a good solution if you can't squirrel proof your suet feeder. These are called upside down suet feeders. And the idea with these is that, so here with your traditional suet feeders, you might get birds like the starling, the European starling here, which is on the left. And not everybody wants starlings in their backyards because they tend to have pretty large flocks and they can really devour things really quickly, uh, which happens. But if you wanna try to dissuade them from your backyard, you can do these upside down suet feeders. And just like how those the woodpeckers had those specialized zygodactyl feet with two toes pointing up, two toes pointing back, that allows them to easily cling to the side of the tree. It also allows them to cling upside down. And here they are feeding upside down from the suet feeder. So it's hard for other birds like starlings and grackles and sparrows to do this, to cling upside down like this, but the woodpeckers can really easily do that. So this is one way to attract woodpeckers and not have some of those other species coming to your to your feeder. And of course, peanuts, they love peanuts. So there's different ways to offer peanuts. You can offer them what are called the peanut pickouts or just the insides of the peanuts. And that's what this feeder is right here. So it's almost like little cock go inside it. And you'll notice that there's no perches. There's not a tray. Woodpeckers can easily cling right to the side of this feeder and they'll peck away at the peanut pieces and, and pull them out piece by piece. So this is a really popular feeder we have here and that's a peanut pig out feeder. Or you can do peanuts in the shell. Same idea. They'll peck away at the shell and pull out the little pieces of peanut from inside. And the woodpeckers absolutely love peanuts all year round, it's always great to feed peanuts. Um, in the winter, of course, it has a lot of protein and fat for them, but even in the spring and summer, they'll eat it and they'll cache it away for the winter. So they will have these different cache sites around too that they use at times like this, when it's hard for them to find some natural sources of food, they go to their cache sites and we'll pull some of this kind of food out. Mealworms they'll also eat, especially during nesting season, once those eggs have hatched they are reliant on lots of insect protein. So putting out mealworms is fantastic. This time of the year, we do freeze-dried mealworms um, because the live would just die outside. It's just too cold for them. So you can do freeze-dried mealworms. And then once it starts to warm up, usually around March or, or so, we start carrying the live mealworms. And that's really what they prefer. If you don't mind feeding them live insects and keeping live insects around, the live mealworms are absolutely the way to go. And you never know nectar and fruit. So when you're putting out your hummingbird feeder and your Oriole feeder, you might get some of these woodpeckers coming to them as well. Um, so they will sometimes drink nectar, especially that yellow-bellied sap sucker. People sometimes get them uh, flickers and red-bellied woodpeckers eating oranges um, from their oriole feeders. So you never know, you might get some woodpecker species eating your oriole and uh, oriole, oriole food and hummingbird food too. And houses. So they are all cavity nesters, all woodpeckers are, and you can attract them with woodpecker houses. So they do tend to be deeper. The cavities tend to be deeper. The whole sizes are larger than your traditional, say, bluebird house. Um, but you can put out nesting boxes for them. You typically want to mount them fairly high, you know, 10 feet up in a tree or so if you can. And in a wooded area is always preferable. Um, but if you have any kind of woods and or a lot of trees around, the woodpeckers can absolutely excavate their own hole. And so keeping stands of dead trees around, as long as they're not in uh, any uh, harm's way, you know, as long as they're not going to fall and 
cause any damage. Keeping those up can help, even if it's just part of the stump of the tree, uh, because that does allow for insects to lay their eggs in there. And that's awesome food for woodpeckers. So woodpeckers absolutely use dead and dying trees for food sources and for nesting. So keep that in mind as well. That is everything I have for you guys today about woodpeckers. If you have questions, absolutely put them in the comments. If you have any kind of sightings, we always love to know what kind of things you're seeing out there. Uh, let's see. Jonathan says, good morning. And Randy says, good morning, everybody, as well. Um, so several people logged in here. So Randy said, had a female flicker at neighbor's yard, also seen a small hawk in flight, couldn't tell the species. So Randy has a flicker that's coming uh, to the neighborhood. So I'll pull up the picture here, the flicker again, and a small hawk in flight. So We've talked a lot about different hawks that are in the backyards right now. The two most common species are going to be your Cooper's hawk and your sharp shinned hawk. If it was a really small bird, so say only slightly larger than this northern flicker or slightly larger than a blue jay, it could be a sharp shinned hawk. The most common bird of prey you'll see in your backyards right now is going to be a Cooper's hawk, which are going to be a little bit larger than that, but smaller than, say, a red tailed hawk. So that uh, could be a, either Cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk. Uh, Karen says, good morning. Uh, Cindy says, good morning. Uh, Liz's weekly broadcasts are so helpful. Thank you, Liz. Oh, you're welcome. It's fun. They're fun to do. Um, so Jonathan says, flicker on our peanut feeder this morning. All right. So Jonathan also has a flicker around and the flicker is coming to his peanut feeder. So that's pretty cool uh, that, that uh, he's getting that coming to his peanut feeder. Um, Pat says, good morning. Good morning, Pat. And Stacy's on. She says, not woodpecker related, but as I was watching your live, I saw a mockingbird on our feeders. Haven't seen one in our yard since the summer. Is this normal? Do they migrate? So this is a really good question. So some of them do migrate. So it's the, they're one of those birds where most of them will go further south for the winter, but there are some that stay that do stay all winter. So uh, not a super common bird to be coming to feeders, but when food is scarce, you might just see them. Uh, mockingbirds are another bird that might come to your Oriole feeders in the spring, especially if you put jelly out. Um, they're known to eat the oranges and eat jelly that you might have out for your woodpeckers. Um, but yeah, I've seen, there's a, a mockingbird in my neighborhood too that I was surprised to see that's been there all winter. So some people are still seeing them and there are some that are definitely still around, but most of them do go south for the winter. Just like birds like robins, um, most of them are gonna go further south for the winter, but there are some that are here all year round. Um, Lynn says, saw a rare chipmunk this morning, put some seeds out for it. Oh, that's, that is pretty rare for this time of the year. Most mammals that we have here don't undergo a true hibernation, meaning they'll kind of stir during the winter. They'll get up here and there. They'll feed some like squirrels are super active all year round, but chipmunks are a species that do actually hibernate. So they go into a deep, deep sleep and they usually don't come out until it's springtime. So that is rare to see a chipmunk this time of the year. Um, Gail says, "Good hello, we have a huge Cooper's hawk in our yard. He has been killing our squirrels. Oh, wow. So Gail has a, has a big Cooper's hawk in her yard. And not only is it a predator of birds, but it's also going after the squirrels. So yeah, Gail definitely has uh, has some hawk activity going on there. Um, Douglas says, hi, Liz, can you show us the device you're using to identify the bird sounds? Yes, absolutely I can. So that is this, this is called an identifier. And how it works is there's different cards you can get. They're two-sided. So on the other side of my woodpecker card happens to be frogs, which is kind of fun. Um, and you slide the card in and then you hit the button next to whatever sound you want to hear. So say I want to hear a spring peeper, which is a type of frog. Um, I just hit the, the button for spring peeper and there it goes. So this is called an identifier. There's different things that you can do 
to identify bird, bird songs. You don't have to have a device like this. If you have a device like this, like a smartphone, um, you can use your phone to do that. There's an app called Merlin, which is totally free. And now they have a feature on there where if you are hearing a bird call, you can pull up your Merlin app. It'll listen to what you're hearing and it will identify the bird for you. So that was a new feature that just came out last year and it's really, really cool. So I'm really looking forward to using that this spring because it wasn't available until like the summertime. Um, so that can open up a whole new world of, of what birds are out there. So the Merlin app is awesome and you can just play calls on it as well. So if you wanna start learning your bird calls, they're all on Merlin also. So there's different things that you can do to learn the um, the calls. And that is, um, it's spelled M-E-R-L-I-N. So Merlin, like the bird. Um, so I don't know if you can see it there, but this is the Merlin app and it's by the, um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So totally free. Um, Cindy says, I see the red-tailed hawk in the Arundquit City area off of 104. So Cindy is also having some hawk activity, red-tailed hawks. So that's another hawk that is here all year round, um, probably going after some, some mammals this time of the year. And Catherine, also I had a red-tailed hawk in my Penfield yard yesterday. So really cool sightings for a backyard to have a red-tailed hawk back there. Ellen says, good morning, Liz. Thank you for all your great information. You're welcome, Ellen. Thank you for your comment. Um, Bob says, OMG, you just scared my dog, Ozzy, with the peepers. Sorry, Ozzy. <laughs> um, and Cindy says, the woodpecker drinking the nectar was a good picture showing the length of the tongue in action. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You can see this woodpecker here is uh, dipping its tongue into that hummingbird feeder. Um, to get the nectar. So you can see the nectar level isn't super high, um, but the woodpecker can still reach in there with its tongue. Same with hummingbirds. So hummingbirds also have really long tongues. And so you don't always have to fill your hummingbird feeder up all the way. They can easily still um, get to that nectar. So some pretty, pretty cool comments. I'm so glad you guys are getting out there and seeing some different birds. Thank you for, uh, for sharing your observations. So that is everything we have for today. We'll be back on Tuesday with another broadcast and we'll share some of your photos. You guys have been sending in some neat stuff. We'll debut our newest caption contest where you can win a $25 gift certificate for the birdhouse. So we'll be back on Tuesday at 10 a.m. with another broadcast. And until then, enjoy your weekend and enjoy your birds.